welcome to the pre-show. I I must tell you, we received a package today in the mail. Every once in a while, our fans reach out to us, Greg. So uh, I'm going to read this letter we received. To Kareem and Greg, thanks very much for all your support of Adrian's music. We really appreciate it. Hope to get to meet you in person soon. Best to you both, Rosanna for Adrian. And in the package we received ah. his, uh, his album. Two copies, one nice. for you, one for me. Nice. Adrian Sutherland, When the Magic Hits, which is uh, exciting. It's got bonus tracks of Respect the Gift and Politician Man. And not only that, Greg, not only that, but we have two T-shirts. Ah. So we have this one. Yep. And we have this one. Nice. Nice. So when is uh, turquoisey blue? Yep. There's some some. It feels like there's some black in there, and then when and then this one here, which is gray. Sweet. Yeah. Very kind. So I'm assuming you want this one, the gray one. I've never seen you wear a color like this before. I do. Uh, I do actually. Oh, you want this one then? No, I'm saying I do have a I do have blue shirts. This is this is making for riveting podcast, by the way. Yeah. All right, so you'll take one of these, whichever one I give to you. Sure. Um, but yes, thank you to Adrian Sutherland, uh, one of uh, our favorite guests. I like him a lot. Yeah. And not only that, but uh, I went on the band camp and picked up Martha and the Muffins' latest release. Marthology, in and out takes. Nice. Yeah, fun little, uh, their most recent uh, release. Go check it out. Mm-hmm. And you can find them on Bandcamp, Martha and the Muffins. And I want to thank you, Greg. So it looked like you wanted to say something. No, you go. Okay. I wanted to thank you for putting up a new section on our website. Ah, uh, Yes. So our website, again, is welcome to the music.com. You got it right this time. That's good. Yeah. Well, I'm looking at it, so I have to make sure. <laughs> okay. And on the website, we have uh, created a section that features our chat with, uh, with Black artists. So if you go there, you'll see the link right on the homepage. Uh, and it features everyone from uh, Maestro Fresh West to Shad, uh, to Zaki Ibrahim, uh, Farley Flex, Roger Mooking, Sait, and so many others. Yep. Uh, so we're, we're excited to bring you uh, that section and these conversations. And uh, like the first episode that shows up here, and this is, in, this is not in any order, is it? It's this random. Is just, it it's shows random. up random. So the first one that shows up is interesting. It's Vin Rock, legendary hip hop artist with Naughty by Nature, mm-hmm. who is coming on again. A repeat guest. Yes, next month with another Greg. Another talk- former guest. Yes, they're teaming up. They work together. Uh, and they're going to come and talk to us about... The metaverse, NFTs, and what uh, this hip hop legend is doing in that space. So I'm I'm really excited. Actually, I'm jacked for this conversation. Yeah, it's going to uh, be great. I'm I'm looking I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to them convincing me that this is a real thing. Yeah. And again, they'll be talking about all of this from a, a music perspective. Yeah. And I and, and again, I've always stated that I do believe that that NFTs will not be what they are today. Cartoon monkeys with lasers coming out of their eyes. 
That's just the one that you purchased. I don't think those are those aren't most of them. That's what I do think. What I do think is it has huge opportunity to Mm -hmm. help artists monetize their music. Yeah. Beyond what we're seeing today with the Spotify's of the world. So I am looking forward to that discussion. I do. I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to learning a lot in yeah, that discussion. Awesome. And that's going to be fun. Let's get to our feature conversation with K the chosen. Hi, the following podcast is brought to you by radical road brewery, the best craft beer in the heart of Leslieville. Find them at 1177 queen street East. That's Radical Road Brewery. Hi, my name's Kay The Chosen. I'm a spoken word and hip-hop artist from Zimbabwe, currently based in Calgary. And you're listening to slash watching Welcome to the Music. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Kay, it's so great to have you join us on the podcast today. Really looking forward to having our chat today. Thanks for having me, Craig. Uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. the first question, I and I ask everybody this, yeah, because um, my parents are from Uganda, <laughs> and um, you know it, it wasn't a choice for us to be here. Good. But you you were recent to Canada, yeah, from Zimbabwe. Mm-hmm. Uh, why Canada, and why Calgary? <laughs> like Good that's one. like cold, man. I feel yeah. for you. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's actually a very funny story. Um, so I came to Canada for, for school. Uh, I came to study business. I knew that I wanted to be involved in the music industry, but I wasn't mm-hmm. too sure, uh, you know, my, my, my like, passion obviously is as an artist, but also I'm very interested in like the, the consulting and like marketing side of things. So I figured, you know, I'm just going to study business. Uh, so in terms of safety, um, price, and just uh, availability of options after graduation. Canada was the best option. Uh, The way I ended up in Calgary though, was due to a little bit of an oversight in my research. So when I looked up Calgary, this would have been like pre-2015 because I came here in 2015. So it might've been 2013, 2014. Calgary was known as the festival capital of Canada, apparently. So I was like, oh, really? fantastic. <laughs> apparently. So I was like, okay, cool. Music festival capital. If I go there, there'll be lots of uh, gigs and whatnot. I didn't realize that they were referring to folk music. I found that mm. out when I arrived. Okay, <laughs> and, again, folk. and I was like, I have been bamboozled. <laughs> uh, but, you know, part of it was also that uh, it's got the most sunshine of all the cities. So coming from Zimbabwe, I'm not very familiar with ultra cold weather. For us, 15 degrees is cold. So as soon as it gets to negative or not even negative, just zero, I'm like, oh, you know, it's cold, even single the digits. Uh, so the fact that it said the most sunshine um, helped. And I've noticed that when I travel, actually, that, you know, even when it is cold, at least it's a bit like you can see, like everything is still pretty um, mm-hmm. uh, sunny. But yeah, when it gets cold, it is it is painful. It is ridiculously <laughs> painful. <laughs> and, and and you've stayed here. You've stayed in Calgary, it seems. Yeah, yeah. So after I graduated, I found that you know the number of people that um, the, the community I built here was just great. I find that um, because Calgary is still like an emerging art scene, there's a lot of uh, friendly competition. There's a lot of people who are willing to try new things because uh, mm-hmm. there's no established sound yet. And I found that. I don't know. That, that's it's a great incubator for someone who's new to to a space uh, because people are welcoming. Uh, there's not so much going on that you get overwhelmed, um, and also that potential to be one of the I guess originators or part of the history of the building of the scene, right? And I think that's that's pretty exciting. Nice. That's cool. So so would you like again? We're talking pre-COVID, but right. What 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 did that scene look like in terms of you know venues and collaboration and recording and that was you know so to be honest like when I just arrived it was very very hard to find venues very very hard to mm-hmm. find um, artists and I think a lot of it was that uh, one we tend to be like a like I said like kind of like an incubator city so people come here they they learn the craft they practice and then they get exported to Vancouver Montreal everywhere else but Calgary so all of the the really like uh, experienced talent tends to leave. 
Okay. So trying to find smaller shows was a bit difficult because everyone was new. Um, but I'm a very independent person, so I just kept scouring until I found shows. And the scene was interesting in that because there was no one sound, you used to get like trap over here. You'd get a little bit of boom bap over there. Mm. And what I found interesting is that because majority of the people here are very into like country or rock music, you find that when it comes to hip hop, not necessarily locally, but uh, just in terms of what people are listening to, a lot of it is like golden era hip hop or old school hip hop. So it's people love um, like Wu Tang here, like like the Wu Tang following in Calgary is ridiculous. Really? So it's like, yeah, like you wouldn't expect it, but um, you find a lot of people are really into like old school hip hop. Like anytime you go to the club, Biggie and Tupac are playing. I'm like, guys, like. I mean, obviously legends, but let's, uh, yeah. let's get to a re- recent decade. So that was interesting because, you know, you'd play your music, which sounds a bit m- more new wave, uh, but then the music playing in the venue in between was a bit older. Um, mm-hmm. I think everything has kind of caught up since then. Um, but yeah, that was kind of like the fascinating thing that I found um, in my earlier years uh, starting off as an artist. Yeah. So mm-hmm. there was no, no desire to get into folk music. <laughs> not yet i think you know after seeing what little nas x has done with country i'm like you know what maybe he's onto something <laughs> maybe he's onto something yeah and yeah. that could be the calgary sound there you go there you go exactly you never know <laughs> now, speaking of old school uh okay what did you think of uh this past weekend's super mm-hmm. bowl halftime show that was incredible like I saw someone take a picture of, you know, all six or seven or so. Yeah, it was about seven of them. And they were like, this is, uh, these are the Avengers. I'm going to tell my grandkids that these were the I Avengers. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it's not all. It's not all. Like, looking at each of their um, influence on hip hop, I think each artist really has had, like, a long-lasting effect on, like, music today. Oh, yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah. For Sorry, sure. I think I cut you off there. You're about to... Say something no, no, I was gonna. No, I was just agreeing with you, hundred percent. And 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 the Avengers. That's a great way to look at it. I mean, you know, I think of even the 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 the, uh, the trailer, the teaser that they released, right? right. Of them right. all coming together. The call, I think it was called the call, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And yeah, Dre being the chess master, and everybody gets the call, and then heads towards it. It's like I got goosebumps because it was just like wow, and you knew it was gonna be awesome. It had to have been awesome. Yeah, it was good. Yeah. yeah. Although my dad, we watched it with my parents and my dad was just watching it. He goes, I don't, I don't get it. I don't, mm. I don't know. I said, dad, you're old. This is, <laughs> this, this is where it's at. <laughs> where is that? But I think it's also one of those, um, I always tell people like celebrity is relative, no matter how, what level mm. of uh, fame you're at. If someone hasn't come across um, that journey that took you to where you are, then they won't kind of uh, experience the same kind of wonderment or excitement. Mm-hmm. Um, a good example is like when um, I think it was the song that Kanye did with Paul McCartney and a lot of people were not familiar with Paul McCartney's catalog. They're like, oh, who's this old guy that Kanye's brought onto his song? Like, he's doing great. Look at Kanye <laughs> providing platforms for up and coming artists. Like, oh, <laughs> you know? Uh, so, you know, no pressure on your dad. I mean, if he's never listened to um, Dre's production throughout the years, obviously he <laughs> you know, just the significance of him bringing all these artists to the era. Yeah. 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 It was really good. Um, You know, talking about that journey, your journey begins in Zimbabwe. Correct. Um, Your dad was a lawyer, Mm -hmm. but you got music from him. Yeah. Like he was your influence. So how, like, how does, how does this happen? So my dad, um, I think even like in my earlier years, he was, he used to DJ. So before he became a lawyer, he was DJing up to like your, your university gig. Uh, so he had like a massive collection of uh, vinyl cassette CDs. So anytime we're going to school, anytime we're like, you know, going on a trip for the weekend, he was always playing music and a uh, majority of it was hip hop or jazz. So I really got into those genres of music. Obviously we played everything, but I think for me, jazz was just so cool. You know, you've got so much being said in just uh, instrumentals and obviously it's Mm -hmm. very easy to freestyle over jazz. So that's where the big influence comes from, where although he was a lawyer, um, there was a lot of like music being played in the the house. And I think from the perspective of being a lawyer, I think just, you know, the love for language, he loved reading. Um, So that's something that he's definitely passed on to me. 
as well as the fact that um, just that presence, you know, as a lawyer, there's a lot of public speaking that goes into there. So in high school, I did public speaking. I did a little bit of Toastmasters. Uh, mm-hmm. So I think for me, obviously music, when you hear it recorded, you just think of, okay, this person is talented. They can sing or they can write lyrics. But for me, I also think about the performance aspect, right? When when I'm on stage, I've got to, I've got to earn your attention, right? So mm-hmm. I think both sides of him being a lawyer and him, him being a DJ have contributed to my overall uh, package as an artist. When when did um, when did you know uh, or, or feel that you know you wanted to uh, to perform, whether it was spoken word poetry or hip hop? So that one's interesting because I don't know if there was any one moment. Uh, so okay. in, in school, I was always involved in speech and drama, so I was always on stage, and I really enjoyed that. Uh, but my brother, he's super talented as an actor. So as soon as I saw him, like, there's a three-year difference between us. Uh, so as soon as he started high school, you know, people were looking at the two of us like, oh, who's the better actor? And I was like, you know what? Okay. I'm going to tap out before <laughs> we can actually, like, compare us. And that's when I got into music. And at that time, I had a bunch of friends. And so in an old boys school, and we used to just, like, freestyle all the time so i used to enjoy that because it's the way to like channel out you know teenage hormones the anxiety the stress the what is happening with my body kind of mentality um so i don't know i feel like i've always just been performing and involved in the arts but i feel maybe the moment where i realized oh i could probably do this professionally was coming to canada i think oh wow okay yeah yeah so like i've been so technically i've been rapping for over 10 years but i'll say professionally it's more like three or four because uh, sure. before it was really just banging on lockers and freestyling and the raps weren't as good so <laughs> i think the last three or four years is where i really honed the craft and it was just being able to upload things to spotify and realize that oh actually people stream this you know getting feedback from people slowly growing my social media following um, and then, you know, getting requests from um, from different organizations saying, hey, you know, we heard the song, do you want to come and perform? Uh, so like when I look back at it, I can't ex- exactly say, okay, at this moment, I knew I wanted to be a performer, but mm-hmm. I can definitely see where it started to become more professional um, in the last couple of years. So I can see, you know, your, your parents are, you know, encouraging you, your dad is introducing you to like uh, Eminem when you're 10 years old. Yep. Um, <laughs> But, you know, they're, they're sending you to Canada to further your education and, I don't know, become a businessman or, you know, yeah. something like that. Mm-hmm. And then you make that call home. Right. To say, uh, Mom, Dad, I've, I've got a gig. I'm getting paid. I'm, this is this is what I want to do. What's that conversation like with lawyer dad? That was a very interesting one. Uh, so good, 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 good question in that um, it was a bit of a... Uh, it had to be eased in. So I was doing open mic events throughout my degree. And anytime that I was doing great in terms of grades, no questions asked. They're like, ah, do what you want, you know? And then anytime I was like, oh, so, you know, that exam result came back and I didn't do too great. Uh, it would be like, because you're always out doing open mics and whatnot. I'm just like, no, it's because I'm bad at math. But <laughs> so that's, that's kind of how that went. And then as soon as I graduated, I think... Um, they, they calmed down a bit. And I think also they started to see just the traction that the music was getting. I think, uh, especially in the last two years, my music has become a lot more, I think it's always been conscious, but it's a bit more direct in what I'm speaking towards. Mm-hmm. And I remember, I can't remember which song it is that I sent to my dad. And he was just a huge fan of it. He sent it to everybody. He was like, really? Oh, but it worked. And it, yeah, it was, it was like mind blowing. Not that he, he wasn't supporting before, but it was a very neutral support to be like, okay, cool. Do what you're doing, what you're doing, whatever. But this one song that I sent, I think it was quarter life crisis. He was just like, no, this is, this is, this is music. My friend, this is music. He sent it to all his colleagues at, at work and I was getting emails like, Oh, you know, you're doing great. I'm like, wow. Okay. This, this, this is acceptance. So at that point I knew, okay, I can keep doing what I'm doing. And he's fully behind it. When was that? Sorry, what was? Uh, when, when was that? Uh, quarter life crisis would have been, I want to say March of last year. So, I mean, like, again, like the support had been there, but this was just like overwhelming support where he was sending it to all his friends. It's like, no, this is a good song. Every once in a while, he'd send me a voice note saying, oh, I'm still playing your song. I'm like, wow. Of all the ones that hit, cool. Awesome. Awesome. That's great. Greg, sorry, go ahead. 
Yeah, no, I was I was going to say it reminded me of um, like I played as a you know, teenager through high school. Right. And then when it was time to go off to university, um, I got accepted to um, into the music program at a couple of different universities. And I decided I was going to go on the road. Yeah. And my parents are both teachers. Well, all my family are teachers. Right. And I like that was sort of the expected. I would go through, get my music degree and become a music teacher. Mm-hmm. And uh so, so when I had that conversation that I wasn't going to university, I was going to defer and, yeah. uh, you know, hit, hit the road. Uh, it didn't go over well. It really didn't go over well. But I will say that that summer, I can't remember when it was, but we were playing Lee's Palace. And we played Lee's Palace numerous times. Yeah. But my dad was in town because they normally spend a lot of time up at the cottage up north. Yeah. He happened to be in town. He came down to Lee's Palace to see us play. And my bud, Martin, who was sitting with my dad, he said, the moment your dad started buying rounds of beer, that's when he knew it was going to be OK. Yeah. <laughs> so similar, like, again, different story, but similar from the perspective of, you know, it was when my dad saw us on stage at Lee's Palace. That's when he's like, OK, maybe yeah. they've got something. So yeah. anyway, I just sorry, I wanted to share that. because No, I appreciate that. I think, like, honestly, um, it's especially in a song that I, I, I made, uh, The African Fathers, and I find, like, um, I don't know what it is, but sometimes father figures tend to have a tougher time showing explicit support. You know, they might support you by not saying no to what you're doing. And from the outside, that might seem like, oh, this is not really supportive. But it's like, no, I mean, if it was a no, I would have known it was a no. Yeah. Like, if I'm hearing neutral, that's that's a sign of progress, you know? Yeah. 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 What about mom? Mom? Oh, that's why I was like, father figures, because mom has been a supporter since day one. If, if anything... Okay. Um, I think I owe a lot of the how polished my sound is to her. Um, so remember before I was mentioning, I used to go to an old boys school and we used to just mm-hmm. like music as like a group of guys just that would go to someone's bedroom, would plug in like that, uh, the headset. So like, you know, the headphones with the little thing dangling out um, and then would record like on, on Fruity Loops on someone's laptop. And, you know, you could hear all the, 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 the noise from the headphone. It was terrible. But she was the one who said, you know, you guys spend five hours on a single track because when you're, when you're recording, you're just hanging out as boys. Here's the studio. I want you guys to go and record at the studio mm. because now you're paying per hour. And quite quickly, our recording time went from five hours to one because you're using your high school budget money to, to record oh, yeah. music. Uh, so she's always been a, a supporter in that way where she's like, look, if you're going to do something good properly, and she tends to be the first person to hear majority of my music. Like when I make a song, I send it to her first. It's mm-hmm. got to kind of pass through her filter. So she'd be like, okay, our flow is on point. Um, you know, does what you're saying make sense? I remember one time she called me out for punchline. I think I'd said, um, uh, it was something to do with like light bulbs. And I think I said, um, franklin instead of edison and she was like nope you got to fix that otherwise someone's going to call you out on this punchline and i was like thank you that was going to be so embarrassing (laughs) (laughs) i sent that out you know so mom day one supporter since 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 day one yeah so that's why there's no cussing in your songs that's why there's mostly no cussing so (laughs) it's a little bit it's like here and there um so it has to be palatable for my mom and that's why i think majority of my music is like child (laughs) Family friend. I wouldn't say child friendly, but family friendly. So if I do use explicit lyrics or explicit topics, it's very intentional. It's not just for the sake of cursing. Nice. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask you about inspiration and subject matter because I mean you've spent most of your life mm-hmm. in Africa. Right. Um, you've spent almost a decade, I think. Um, you know, in, in Canada. Right. Uh, up there. Yeah. In in cold and frigid Calgary, except for that, like a few days in the winter where you can wear shorts and t-shirt outside in the snow. Yep. Um, Yeah. But tell me like, how do you, like, do you have to, do you find yourself wanting to have a balance of where you, where you, where you're inspired um, or like, like how does that work for you today? Uh, so interesting enough, I find that Calgary and, and uh, the, the city that I'm from, Harare, uh, that's the capital city of Zimbabwe, they mirror each other in a lot of ways. So Harare and Zimbabwe as a whole are not doing great economically, uh, just due to like, uh, just uh, politics and just our history in terms of how we've managed resources. But then also one of the biggest things is that um, 
a lot of our money comes from tourism and just, you know, obviously with the pandemic, but also just uh, being slow, slow and developing than the countries around us, you know, the tourism is not as high as it should be. Um, but also that we tend to export a lot of our talent and it doesn't, it's not limited to, to, to arts, but, you know, all our engineers, all our doctors, because our resources are low, tend to go to other countries where, you know, they've got the infrastructure that they need. And because they've gone to another country to learn things, they end up staying there, right? Mm. And I find in terms of the art scene, Calgary is the same, where I think there's a lot of potential. There's a lot of talented artists in the city, but a lot of them tend to go outside, you know, to further their craft. So when it came to being an artist, I found that um, because of that similarity, um, I was able to kind of find the weaknesses and strengths in Calgary and also the topics that needed to be discussed. And mm-hmm. because so many people come in and out, I find that obviously Canada as a whole has a very diverse uh, uh, group of people because majority of us are immigrants. But specifically in Calgary, again, because it's a newer city, you're finding a lot of uh, students from around the world are here. And sometimes they end up going to other cities. But I found, oh, okay, so majority of us can relate to the immigrant experience or the diasporan experience. So I figured, you know, just write about what you know. So I kept on writing about those kinds of topics. And then obviously those end up overlapping with things that even those who are not from out of um, the country can relate to. Because when it comes to the immigrant experience, you can then look at things like um, mental health. You know, how does being away from home affect how you navigate your day to day? And obviously, no matter where you're from, some we all uh, experience some level of mental wellness, what mental mm-hmm. wellness um, issues, yep. uh, as well as the fact that you know you've got the concept of um, social media and how that can influence people's development, right? And I found that you know being from Zimbabwe, our uh, or the impact that social media has in what we can and can't do is fairly large in that uh, when there were protests happening, you know, the government literally just switched off the internet and you couldn't access home. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was, it was wild. So, you know, you then begin to understand the power of social media and also, you know, the effects can have both uh, positively and negatively. So I found even like talking about that more, you know, people have been like, yeah, you know, I'm from Sudan and some of the things have happened to us. Oh, I'm from India. Some of the things have happened to us where the government just switches it off. But if I was purely from Canada, I might not understand that because, you know, obviously right now people can debate that, oh, you know, the government controls a lot of things, but the concept of freedom is a bit different because you can see, okay, how much can we push the government here and how much can you push the government back home? Um, so I, I'm not overly political when it comes to my music, but this is kind of the view that I have where I think being from Zimbabwe has allowed me to have maybe a more uh, concentrated opinion on some of these things. So when I bring it here, it might feel exaggerated, but then that's a good thing, right? Where by giving you this huge example of it you can begin to break it down in your own context interesting fascinating yeah so a lot of the inspiration is real life honestly or at least hearing from other people's real life experiences i want to get your take on something okay um mm-hmm. you know we're recording this on february the 15th right um obviously in mm-hmm. zimbabwe there's no such thing as black history month Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. So when you come to Canada in your first February here, and there's Black History Month, what what did that mean to you then? Mm -hmm. And then I'm curious about what it means to you today. Hmm. Okay, that's brilliant, brilliant brilliant question. So in all honesty, I do not remember what my first uh, Black History Month would have been like. Um, given that it was February, chances are I was probably like, it is cold. It is cold. <laughs> <laughs> it is freaking cold. That's probably all I was thinking about first year. Uh, but I do know like earlier on, that was my concept. Like, like my, my thinking is like, well, you know, Black History Month is such a foreign concept to me because, you know, back home, Black people are the majority, you know, so we don't need a month dedicated. Obviously, we do have other... Uh, periods in time where we maybe celebrate like our independence because we used to be a British colony. So obviously we still do have similar uh, colonial history, Mm -hmm. but in terms of, because I mean, Black History Month is really a North American thing, right? And we're looking at, um, you know, the transatlantic slave trade and then um, 
you know, just that history. So to be honest, like in my earlier years, I didn't really, um, I want to say interact with the concept. I knew what was happening around me. I'm like, okay, cool. Awesome. Whatever. Uh, But as we get closer to present day, where, like I said, as an artist, a lot of times I look at immigrant issues. I began to understand that, look, even if you don't consider yourself North American or African-American, there are still aspects of the North American Black experience that you benefit from or that you experience. Mm -hmm. And when I say benefit from, I'm a rapper. You know, rap comes from, you know, there's a lot of that culture that comes from uh, North American Black history in that, you know, in, on during the slave trade, a lot of the, the spirituals that were sang on plantations, you know, those were coded messages, um, you know, to, to let people know, okay, so-and-so is coming or we're leaving tonight and things like that. And I think it's, it's important. That's why there's so much wordplay in rap. You know, it comes from that concept that, hey, you know, what we're saying sounds like one thing to one person, but someone who's on the inside understands, you know, that's why... Um, this is concept of, uh, I forget the, the exact term, but essentially it's like American English that's based on black culture. So it's things like saying the hood or um, honestly things like on fleek, you know, it all sounds like slang, but a lot of it, it comes from black culture. Like they're talking to each other and it gets popularized in the media and then it becomes like common sayings. Yeah. So, you know, as I was developing and I was in Canada longer, I started to understand, hey, look, you know, this might not be my history, but I think it's important for me to learn this as well. And around that time, I actually got asked to do a presentation um, by the Ethnic Festival. They asked me to do a presentation on, you know, uh, hip hop's African roots, as well as how that connects to North American music. And that's how a lot of this started to make sense. It's like, oh, okay. As I did the research, I'm like, wow, there's actually so much connection, you know, because uh, even for that concept of, you know, MCs and like poets coming to, Af- uh, to, 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 to North America, it's a spiritual and traditional thing in Africa where, you know, quite often histories were passed on through oral tradition. So when you've got the oral tradition going on, you've got people playing drums and you've got someone speaking and telling the story. Essentially, that's your DJ and your MC. Right, you've got the music yep. behind the beat. scenes, you've got the beat, and you've got someone presenting the story. Mm-hmm. So the parallels are insane. So as that started happening, I was like, you know what? Don't discredit Black History Month. It's so important whether you're, you you relate to being a Black American or not. Um, and since then, now like so, like this year, I've had so many performances that have come up uh, because it's Black History Month. Yeah. And I just make sure to be clear that hey, look. I appreciate that, you know, this is why you call on me, but also I identify as an immigrant artist. I identify as an African artist, but this period in time is super exciting for me now because I get, you know, how we got to this place and kind of how that has contributed to the kind of art that I make. Hmm. Nice. Thanks for sharing that. That's really an interesting perspective for sure. Mm -hmm. 2021 has been a, uh, has been your breakout year. Would that, would that be fair to say? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Like lots of things have happened. Not only did your mom love or did your dad love that particular song, uh, Quarter Century, and uh, or what was it? Was it called Quarter? Not Quarter Century. What was it? Uh, Quarter Life Crisis. Quarter Life Crisis. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I turned twenty five last year, so that that's where the name comes from. Yeah. yeah. So not only did your dad, you know, spread that around with his friends, but you seem to get a lot of a lot of attention Mm -hmm. uh, in in twenty twenty one. is that just a result of you putting in your time, putting in your hours and, so, and it just broke through or, you know, was there a, a planned concerted effort to make some noise last year? i will say it's a bit of both. So the plan to make some noise last year came from reflecting on, I guess, the growth since 2015, right? So again, like I said, I've been quote unquote rapping for 10 years and I'm like, huh. I've gotten considerably better than when I used to be when I was 15. Right. But also I think I was starting to hone in on my purpose as an artist. I was starting to hone in on, you know, what the audience needs to hear and also how I can continue to be my most authentic self. So within working on this latest project advice, um, you know, it was a combination of looking at, okay, what messages have hit home in my prior music, but also what am I going through right now? And the kind of like the the Venn diagram where it was overlap on both ends was that this pandemic had us 
indoors for a long time. So this reflection that I was doing was a reflection that everybody was doing, you know, looking at, okay, um, you know, I had a job yesterday and now I don't, you know, what is my purpose in life if I'm not working? You know, what is my purpose in life now that things have become so uncertain? And I think we also had a lot of um, people pass away over the last two years. I mean, like obviously people pass every day, but I think there were a couple of like very high profile passes. So, you know, uh, we lost Kobe, we lost Chadwick Boseman. I think this is the first time I've seen like global reaction to deaths. I think we've had celebrity deaths in the past, but it's usually like a section. It's like, oh, this is specifically for people who are into basketball. But even if you went into basketball, Kobe's death, I think, just shook the world. Mm-hmm. Same with Chadwick Boseman. Mm-hmm. Even if you're not a Marvel mm-hmm. fan, you've seen him in some um, capacity. And I think even just the circumstances surrounding it that, you know, he'd been struggling with cancer for so long, but had been graceful and just pushing on, you know. So writing the album was a lot of like, okay, so what does what does grief look like to us? You know, how does this affect our mental well-being? How does being indoors affect us? And, um, you know, how does this actually connect us as human beings? So as I was working on that project, you know, more things kept on happening around the world. And I felt just this inner purpose where I'm like, this album cannot be like the others where, you know, I just release it and my friends hear it and we're like, cool, good stuff. And then we move on. I felt like it was an album that more people needed to hear because I think a lot of people needed to hear that they weren't the only ones going through that. A lot of people needed to find the words for what they're expressing. And to be honest, I think that's where a lot of the push came from, where I had, I would, I'd invite as many friends as I could. I'm like, hey, I'm doing a song about colonialism. I don't think it's right to talk about this without involving indigenous artists because my perspective of colonialism is from Zimbabwe. Um, obviously, the North American experience is different, you know. So they came in, they gave their perspective. Obviously, when the song came out, they shared it with their communities. Their communities like, oh my goodness, this is so, this is what we've been waiting for and they shared it with theirs. So each song had that kind of um genuine collaboration and genuine story behind it Mm -hmm. and then on top of that you know obviously i put in the extra effort to like hey i want to make sure that this goes as far as possible so before i've always done my own press because i love to learn but i'm at a point where for the weight of what i'm trying to do i can't do this alone you know so i I reached out Mm -hmm. to our firm you know they were able to help me push the press and i don't know i feel like the story was selling itself because they were like this is great this is community focused you're talking about stuff to do with the pandemic and the music itself is good because sometimes you've got a great story but the music is like so so you know but everything was kind of where it needed to be and i found that since then even though we've kind of stopped the press run I'll just be sitting and then, you know, I'll get a request on Instagram. Like, Hey man, I just heard this song. Like I lost my mom um, a couple of months ago and hearing Petrichor really helped me through that. Thank you for the song. So I won't lie. I've had like a lot of really heavy conversations in the last couple of months. Mm -hmm. Uh, But to me, I think that's better than any groundbreaking streaming numbers or any amount of awards is knowing that people have genuinely felt um understood and seen and heard through this album and yeah that's the that's the thing that i'm most grateful for about this run so i feel like it's been a breakout but also more of a a reach out like i've successfully reached out to people this time around nice and you're you're obviously oh go ahead you're obviously talking about uh advice correct yes yes correct correct awesome greg go ahead yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna ask. So you, you, you've talked about some of the inspiration and the themes and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, particularly as we're in COVID, we don't like to dwell on COVID. We 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 used to dwell on COVID at the beginning of the COVID, and now we're however many years in, yeah. seventeen years into it, I think now. <laughs> um, no, but more from the perspective of like, what's what's the process? You talked about bringing in some other artists now. Like, what's the process to do this album? Okay. Do you want that with the COVID related stuff or just? <laughs> yeah, sure. No, no. Yeah, no. I mean, I, again, I, what, I, what I meant by that is we, mm. we used to talk a lot about COVID, but but we, we do have to put it in context. So putting that in you know context of COVID, you know, what was the process of pulling this together? Okay. So I will say that I'm lucky in that by the time that I got to this album, uh, one, I'd released a couple already. So I already knew mm-hmm. the process of writing, reaching out to yeah. people, not. But two, because it was pre-pandemic, I knew majority of the people personally. So that was important because, uh, like I said, like some of these topics are very sensitive. So you can't just reach out to someone by email and say, hey, you're Indigenous. Do you want to be on this song? They'll look at you like, hey, you're trying to tokenize me. And you're like, well, what's, what's going on? <laughs> you know, where this is friends where I'm like, oh, yeah, we do cypher all the time. I know we've always been talking about having a song together. This might be a bit heavy, but are you interested? 
So it was a lot of Zoom calls. It was a lot of emailing back and forth. I think I am a Google Drive pro now because of just the number of folders and meetings and stuff I had to organize. Uh, so it was interesting because I think to a certain extent, the pandemic did kind of help my process in that um, because all of the meetings were over Zoom, it didn't matter where someone was, we could have a conversation at any time. It also helped in that uh, similar to what we're doing right now, I could record those meetings. So record those meetings and I could play them back. I'm like, what did we discuss? What, what was the tone of voice when I when I gave the suggestion? Um, it also makes for great BTS material. So, you know, there was a lot of advantages with that, but also that um, because at some point everything was closed, you can even go to like a friend's house and I recorded at my friend's Rome's uh, home studio. So I had to get a mic. I had to go on Kijiji, get someone to send me a cheap mic. Like I'm by no means an audience your engineer so a lot of it was just recording references but I know that in the past when I wrote songs I would like write them record them on my phone and then listen back to them and like okay cool go to the studio but this time around because I had more advanced recording equipment I was able to play with melodies more because before mm. I, I would only have just that one layer right because it's my voice the beat playing in the background and my phone recording it but now that I had a mic I could record all the different takes so I think I was able to play a lot more with the music this time around because I had more time to hear the different ideas. Uh, I also got a lot more feedback because I'd record it and then send it to someone and say, hey, this is the idea. What do you think? So it was an incredibly collaborative album uh, from beginning to end, which I think really helped make sure that all the stories and experiences were genuine. Um, I would say that it did make the process take a little longer than I would have liked. But again, because we're in a pandemic, there was no rush. I was like, hey, you want to release the album tomorrow? And then everyone's at home. They can't hear it anyway. So, you know, take time. So I'm lucky that by the time that we were done, restrictions had eased up enough that we're actually able to do like a live uh, release event. So people got to hear some of the songs live. We were able to premiere one of the music videos. Um, so yeah, it was like the entire process was very collaborative. Um, and then just lots of back and forth feedback and kind of getting an idea of, okay, what's working and what's not. That's great. Yeah. One of the albums, one of the albums, one of the <laughs> videos right. that I, that I saw was uh, her anthem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great song. Thank you. Uh, really interesting video as well. Right. Um, tell, tell me about that song, the idea behind it. And then, uh, you know, these three rappers that you recruited. Right. So that song, definitely one that I knew was going to be like a highlight on the album. So it was one of the first songs we recorded, actually. I think like by the time that the song came out, it was probably a year old. And, you know, <laughs> the rappers were like very tense. They were like, hey, can we put this song out now? Like you, it's a good song. I want to hear it. I'm like, don't worry. I've got a plan for this. It's going to be part of the album. So I appreciate their patience because at the end of it, they realized, oh, okay, we, we see why you waited for so long. Uh, so... Obviously, the main theme being that, you know, all three of them are female identifying rappers. And that was because um, by this time, as I was working on the album, I knew that, you know, it's a concept album and it revolves around the death of a female character. And, you know, one of the reasons why it takes that perspective is just so throughout the last couple of years, I've lost fairly important female characters in my life. So I lost my grandmother. I lost an aunt. Um, I'm also very close with both my mom and my stepmom. So, you know, telling the story from a female perspective was just important to me. And I figured, you know what, there's no way you can have this whole narrative looking at female characters and it's being told from a male perspective. I'm like, you are waiting for someone to cancel you there. So <laughs> I reached out to, you know, three very close friends. Um, Z the Free was really like the connecting factor throughout the album, to be honest, because she runs this thing called Cypher Club, where we used to meet once a week on a Wednesday evening, we play beats for three hours and we just rap. And that's how I got to know a lot of um, artists around the city is how my freestyling got better. So I figured, you know, there's no way she can't be on the album. So once I had her, um, you know, we then brought in Bivite, who was, who's also uh, someone I know from Cypher. And at that point, I, I looked at the two sounds and styles that we had. I'm like, okay, cool. The perfect person to ban us, this is Dorsa. Uh, so as soon as I had the three of them in, um, you know, I sent them the, the instrument and I said, hey, look, uh, I want to do the cypher style. You know, going back to old school hip hop, we've got to have this, you know, one after another kind of vibe. You know, I don't want it to be, you know, verse, hook, verse, hook. I feel like that's very formulaic. I just want you to bring your best bars and you're just going to go one after the other and I'll just be on the outside 
on the on the hooks and they love the idea um so we put the song together and as soon as it was done i was like this this has to have a music video we cannot release the song without a music video so given that we had you know the three female rappers they're all giving like very badass kicking ass uh type lyrics um i wanted the visuals to be very reminiscent of like kill bill or charlie's angels and that's how we ended up with that kind of uh theme of them kind of kicking butt in each of their scenes but like trying to find something that that they had to bring towards the end of the video i felt like uh you know it's one thing to see action in a music video but it's another thing to see action and a story because if you keep watching you see you're seeing okay something's happening they're collecting items what's what's the story behind this so it keeps you engaged from beginning till end and then again with it being a community project we found um you know we're going to need a lot of uh, uh venues for this shoot so we reached out to three different businesses we said hey can we shoot in your location if you let us do that you know we'll will advertise your business. And they were very down, especially uh, given that we're still kind of coming throughout the lockdown, right? So their business has been closed because it's a barbershop, a boxing ring, and a, the, and a cafe. You know, the cafe was open a little bit, but obviously boxing ring is a bit more closer contact. And so is a barbershop, you know? So they were excited. They're like, yeah, get us on this music video so that people see it. They nice. see the business and, you know, everybody benefits from that, right? So... Yeah, it was like again very collaborative in that in that sense where we ha- were able to support local businesses, um, but also they were just so excited to see the video. Um, I, was, I remember I mentioned the the release event before. So mm-hmm. what we did is when the album came out, uh, I performed some of the songs live, and then before the video came out on YouTube, we played the the video live um, at this event, and we invited everyone who was involved, so the cast. Um, the the artists as well as um, the venues. So the the three businesses they came through, and they was just so excited to see you know their businesses on screen. So I think even that was like that was like a really great moment in terms of this whole campaign was just seeing people's faces like oh man that's me oh uh, this was awesome. That's that good. Yeah. Listen, Kay, I want to ask you. We have a segment <laughs> okay. called Lost Venues. Right. Um, so I'm curious, you know, whether, you know, here in Canada or or back home, mm-hmm. um, you know, is there a venue that you've got uh, fond memories of mm-hmm. uh, or maybe a crazy story of uh, yeah. that happens to not exist anymore? Okay. So I thought about this one. Um, I want to talk about the Hi-Fi Club because the Hi-Fi Club never uh, doesn't exist anymore. But I've never performed there. I've only gone okay. there for events. So I'm going to go with a different one, but this one's not a venue itself. It's more of like a show that used to exist. And it was called Raw Voices. It was run by a friend of mine um, in university. So she's a poet and she decided that she wanted an open mic series where you get a rapper, oh, not a rapper, a musician, a poet, and uh, a comedian. So that used to happen once a month. And They were planning to slow it down anyway. They'd been running for three years, but she wanted to work on a bigger project. But the reason I miss it is because uh, when I was still new to the live performance scene, having somewhere to perform once a month was great because, you know, it's the same crowd. You get a month to prepare. And each time you can perform the same thing. You can perform something different. It was a great place for testing new music, but also just building my stage uh, confidence. And in all honesty, when I first started doing live shows, I am actually terrible at remembering lyrics. Like I am God awful. <laughs> whether, it's, whether it's my lyrics or like an actual song, unless I've heard it a lot of times, like I get lyrics mixed up all the time. So whenever I performed there, I just freestyled. Like I was like, you know what? I'm not going to do my actual lyrics because if I, if I fumble them, I'm going to feel bad. Uh, so I got really good at freestyling and I got really good at freestyling off crowd participation. So I'd get in there and say, hey guys, I want you to just shout words at me because it was a small enough venue where it was a very intimate experience. So they would just shout a word at me. And as they shout that word, I put it into my freestyle and it used to blow people's minds, you know? And for me, I was like, that's great. Like they had a good time. I had a good time. And by the time that, you know, I'd done a couple of years of that, you know, performing on stage was not as scary anymore because I'm like, well, if I can freestyle and grab things right out of the air, you know, performing prepared content, which people have heard and excited for was way much, it was so much easier. Yeah, so interesting. Yeah, yeah, that was a great yeah, yeah. proving ground for me. So, so you you spoke about you know the mix of freestyling and spoken word. Um, you're also a spoken word artist, and we haven't really talked about that. Can you talk about the importance of spoken word to you? And 
you know, and, and, and your body of work? For sure. So spoken word comes from the fact that um, obviously before I was a rapper, I was in school and we had uh, literature classes and English classes and I quite enjoyed breaking down poetry. And I think it's also part of where my love for hip hop comes from, where you hear a line and like, wait, what does he mean? And you go and do the research like, oh, okay, I get the bar now. You know, so I love poetry for the analysis point of it. Um, To be honest, like the line is now so blurred when it comes to like writing spoken (laughs) word and writing rap for me, because if I hear a rhythm, it it automatically becomes rap. But I think poetry has its own rhythm as well. Um, But in terms of its importance to me, I think that when it comes to slightly more serious issues where I'm really not trying to get you to dance, I really just want you to sit and listen. I tend to go more spoken word because it has a more serious tone. It has uh, a slightly more attentive audience. I find when I talk to people about songs, the first thing they say is like, Oh, I love the beat. I'm like, awesome. I didn't make the beat though. I just made the words. So, you know, I guess you're congratulating me on like my, my uh, instrumental selection, but in terms of like the part that I put in, like I can't say much about the beat. Right. So spoken word is always a great way for me to get like super honest feedback, um, a way for me to really channel my thoughts on a topic without it getting too metaphorical. Um, Like I intentionally make my music that way so that it's a bit more accessible, where it's it's not specific to one person. But when it comes to spoken word, I do want it to kind of tackle or speak to a specific audience. Um, And then I found that because I go between rap and spoken words a lot, a couple of people have said that now my delivery and my rap sometimes doesn't even sound like I'm rapping. It sounds like I'm talking, but with the melody behind me. And they like that. They're like, that's so cool because I feel like if I just close my eyes and listen, it's like, you're talking to me, but like, I'm still like bopping my head as you talk to me. I'm like, Oh, that's, that's awesome. So. That's awesome. Um, Do you mind sharing with us a little spoken word? I know we've asked you to. Yeah. You're open to that. I am open. And I think. I was trying to decide which one to do. And I think given that, uh, you know, we did mention that, you know, it's February, it's Black History Month. And I also mentioned mm-hmm. that, you know, I try to make it more uh, direct. I'll give you a spoken word that is looking around um, Black issues. I wrote it two years ago. Might be three now. The pandemic is making it hard to remember. Yeah, exactly. when, uh, but it was at the, the, the height of uh, the George Floyd protests and, you know, that was happening in, within like our neighbors to the South, but, you know, I was reflecting on okay, so what does that mean for me being an African artist, but also what does that mean for me being in Canada? Uh, and it just so happened that at that time, there was a song uh, by Denzel Curry and Flying Lotus called Black Balloons. And they just released the instrument. I said, Hey guys, write to this. So I ended up writing a spoken word piece to it. And yeah, it's been one where every time Black History Month comes about, I feel like I need to perform it at least once because I think it it kind of drives my feelings and emotions towards it pretty, pretty directly. Uh, yeah, so I'll do Black Balloons. Black boys plotting, Black balloons popping. Melon and settling, but ain't no stopping. My tribe, my life important. Bloodlines colonized and then imported. Men in the troops set loose to die on front lines, but still treated as if they were foreign. Entities with no empathy, no sympathy. Things ain't changed since the days of slavery. So we call you massa, can't afford a bachelor's degree. Stuck in streets, packing heat, selling weed, murder beef, first degree, killing all of our dreams. Take our pillows and our sheets, take our pillows and our sheets. So we die in the cold, the story unfolds. Self-fulfilling prophecy, the story untold. Don't believe in ourselves, or we see our ourselves. Genetic mental imprisonment, it's all in ourselves. We're at war with ourselves. Crabs in a barrel mentality, they're reading the eulogy, mourning the death of black family. No unity, it's you or me, my brother, the enemy. Way before Corona, we were all on quarantine. Keep it six feet if you look like me, might confuse me for Trayvon Martin. Cause I'm hooded and a brother in the dark skin. The hidden figures were treated just like Martians. Never give us credit for success we took part in. So we out here. Hell yeah, we marching. Brothers can't breathe without, brothers can't breathe in the streets. That's a problem. Sisters can't sleep without cops trying to barge in. If you can't see, then you're part of the problem. Don't protest my protest. Yeah, we marching. Oh yeah, man, we marching. Nappy hair, fist in the air. We don't care. Hell yeah, man, we marching. These balloons are not popping. Yeah. Awesome. 
Wow. Finger, finger snaps. Thank you. Nice. <laughs> Black balloons. K the chosen. Thank you so much for sharing. That was really good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Sorry. Just take it out again. Just oh, yeah, take yeah, it yeah. out again. That's what I was saying, right? <laughs> about the poetry yeah. where I think when you've got a beat behind it, like you're listening, but it doesn't quite hit. When when it's just the words, it's like, whoa, okay, I'm catching every single, every single thing being said. So I get yeah. 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 Powerful. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and again, as, 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 a, as a, 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 a white dude, I have no idea. So I will, I, I uh, thank you. All right. Um, so, so one of the questions we'd like to ask, and this makes it light from the heavy, not heavy, but yeah. from yeah. a great topic mm -hmm. um, that needs to be discussed. Um, so one of the questions I'd like to ask before we wrap things up is what's in your earbuds lately? What are you listening to that people should be checking out? Oh, man, that's such a hard question. <laughs> I listen to a lot of music. Uh, so right now, I really, oh, actually, so... Saba, S-A-B-A. -A. He's an artist from Chicago. He just released uh, an album, a few, a few good things. or well, good things will come. I, 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 good things coming soon. I think that's the name. Yeah, yeah. So I bring that one up because he's also looking at uh, uh, Black issues and kind of like his place in the world. I think he's recently just had a huge ascension in, 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 in his development as an artist. So in this project, he's, he's reflecting on that. Like, you know, what does it mean to be you know, the person who made it out when it comes to like going back to your hood, you know, you know, you've got all these friends and asking you for handouts. You've got people saying you've changed. You maybe don't even want to be a celebrity. You know, you just love music, you know? So listening to that has been interesting because um, I guess like was mentioned before, 2021 was a huge year for me and I'm still seeing the effects of that. And personally now I'm like, okay, I know the music I want to put out next, but now there's pressure before I used to put out music and it's like, oh, okay, cool. And I could just put out whatever I wanted. Now I'm like, if I put out rubbish, <laughs> people are going to call it out. Like this is trash, <laughs> you know? So there's that pressure to like, you know, um, surpass the bar that I've set, but also remain true to myself. Um, I also just love his music. I think he's one of those rappers who goes in and out of like melodic flows and like strict rap verses so well. Um, and it's something that I'm working on, on myself. Um, yeah, there's a couple of other artists I'm listening to, but I think that's my best answer right now because that that's right. very recent. It just came out. Uh, there's a lot yeah. of songs that I like from it. And his style has also just changed a lot from the last couple of projects he put out. And I think... I don't know. He's one of those people where I think he should be way bigger than he is. Like he's pretty big, but I'm like, nah, like he's amazing. So if I can put people onto Sava, then I'll do that. Yeah. Right. That's awesome. Thanks. I think, I think we actually had, a, I can't remember who it was, but a guest in the last month or so mentioned Sava as well. So yeah. That's, yeah. that's fascinating. Thank okay. you. Thanks for sharing that. No, you're welcome. Yeah. I wonder if it was Shai who, who told us to check out Sava. I'm trying to think of Shad or was it Mooking? The raw, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway. I can't recall, but you're right. That that name does sound familiar if, if someone mentioning Saba for sure. Yeah. yeah. Kay the Chosen, thank you so much. Thank you. For for joining us today. Um, check out the YouTube channel, Kay the Chosen. Check out the video and song, Her Anthem. I think it's really, really good. Thank if you. people want to consume more of your music, find out more about you. Where can they go? So I always direct people to Instagram. It's the platform that I'm most active on. And I think it's the platform that gets like all my traffic goes to Instagram, you know, so YouTube will only get the visuals. TikTok will only get the funny stuff. Uh, Instagram gets every, like I do some nonsense things on TikTok, uh, but thankfully everything is under the same name. So just K the chosen as one word. Um, if you are looking for music, uh, same name, but streaming platforms, we're not a fan of a sentence being one word. So it's K space, the space chosen um, on everywhere, so oh. by Apple Music and all that. But come through my Instagram. My Instagram is funny. Um, it's also got a lot of serious stuff. And also I tend to interact with people quite often. So if they respond to a story or if they DM me, um, this is actually how a lot of the conversations around mental wellness were, were coming through where someone would send me a, a message and say, hey, thanks for the song. Um, it really helped me through ABC. I tend to respond. So hit me up on awesome. Instagram. There you yeah, go. Instagram.com slash K the Chosen. Exactly. Again, thank you so much. This has been fun. No, it's been my pleasure. Thank you both for having me. Great conversation. And it's been a pleasure to meet you both. Thank you.